Modern computers are using the von Neumann architecture, which separates compute and memory. With GPUs, graphics processing units, and TPUs, tensor processing units, we see a trend towards more neuromorphic hardware. Those chips are great for neural network acceleration. Some experts believe that it takes five years till they first become commercially available. Spiking neural networks are a class of brain-inspired AI algorithms that run natively on neuromorphic hardware. What is great about them is that execution and storage happens on-site and no memory transfer is needed. The benefit shows in the speed, its energy consumption and with those its area. They are also biological plausible. Because of this, they are of great interest for mobile real-time systems. We want to take a look how to train spiking neural networks and what is possible with them. Real-time systems can be trained with reinforcement learning. This framework was developed by Stuart and Russell. An agent perceives an environment and acts on it. A system designer designs one or multiple reward functions which return the reward to the agent. Here the agent consists of an actor-critic implementation. The critic forms an internal representation of the reward using the state percept and memory. The internal representation of the reward is then fed to the neurocontroller, an actor which is constructed using neurons. Information in the brain is transmitted in electrical impulses, which we call spikes. Incoming spikes via dendrites increase the potential in the neuron. If the potential reaches a critical point, a spike is elicited and travels along the axon to the synapse to other neurons. The effect it has on a connected neuron is determined by the strength of the synapse. In the computational context, this strength is also called the weight. A leaky integrated file model copies the behavior of a biological neuron. Plotted, it could look like this. Incoming spikes increase the potential. Once it reaches the threshold, it creates a spike. The potential leaks over time. This time dimension differentiates spiking neural networks from artificial neural networks. Here the weighted activity is just summed up and put into an activation function. Finding the right weights is the core of the learning process. An implementation of the proposed Hebbian learning has been found in spike time dependent plasticity, short STDP. When the presynaptic neuron fires shortly before the postsynaptic neuron, the strength increases. If the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron, the weight decreases. STDP learns the causal and anti-causal correlation of these events. An extension to this learning rule is RSTDP. Here a third factor is used. In brains, the third factor is found in the distribution of the neural modulator acetylcholine or dopamine, typically distributed in volume transmission. How to copy this mechanism for our artificial system? How must the neural modulator be designed? In some papers, the reward function is directly used and thereby skipping the critic. For delayed problems, it is better to use the utility function, or similarly the Q function, the state action value function. Delta U, the difference in the value of subsequent states, is an instance of a Q function. It also ensures that M is sometimes above zero and sometimes below zero. The problem with this approach is that an agent will be typically rated better in the beginning than at the end of a trial when it has failed. So in a trial, the neural modulator is biased towards negative values. Here it becomes really complicated. Different methods to solve this problem have been suggested, like the dynamic baseline. It's an exponentially weighted task-based average. This method is equivalent to using the temporal difference error. Temporal difference learning is a method to learn the state value function in the critic. The critic is a state value function which maps a state to its value. This mapping has to be learned by the agent. By doing actions in the environment, the agent perceives new states. Each state is a sample out of the state space, the mathematical abstraction of all possible states. The state space needs to be discretized, so many samples can land in the same cell. Once the state value function has been learned, the RSTDP training process comes to an end, although the neurocontroller hasn't fully learned the actions it should perform.
the design of the critic and the learning mechanism goes hand in hand. They are applied on a neural network, which consists of three areas of input encoding, connections and output encoding. One way of encoding is using the rate code. The signal amplitude is translated to a firing rate, where a high signal amplitude means a high firing rate and a low signal means a low firing rate. Another option is to use grid cells. Here again we have the state space. It is covered with receptive fields which are connected to the grid cells. When a sample is near a receptive field it causes the grid cell to fire. This is how the full architecture then could look like. For the input place cells are used. For the output layer rate code is used. Notice the lateral inhibition in the output layer. They are needed when the discrete action is chosen. Let's look at the example that we have one place cell active and it's connected to two opposing actions. The weight between the upper and the lower neuron is slightly different. So the SCDP effect is slightly different for each weight. Now when the action is chosen because the activity of the positive neuron cell was bigger than on the negative, the reward is based solely on the upper cell. Now the neuromodulator is distributed and both weights get updated. However, the negative cell didn't have an effect on the activity. The activity level doesn't really matter unless it's less than the most active one. So we can add lateral inhibition so to suppress the activity of low active neurons. It's similar to a softmax layer in artificial neural networks. When I analyzed this micronet, I observed something interesting. The action is just decided by the difference in the weights. It can therefore be reduced to a single value. We can do this reduction for each input cell. This simplified model was first described in 1975 by J.S. Alibus as a cerebellar model articulation controller, or short CMAG. The place field's approach suffers from the curse of dimensionality. With each dimension, the number of required fields grows exponentially. One approach I tried is to use vector quantization. With each sample, we measure the distance to every place field. Based on the distance, the place fields are then moved towards the sample. This is then repeated for every sample until the space is covered non-uniformly. With this approach, it is possible to outperform a net with just 2% of the neurons. The plot shows the average return in the card pole balancing problem. I hope you learned something new in this video and if you are further interested in this topic, you might want to read my thesis or take a look at my implementation of the described framework using the Nest Simulator library.